Uh, thank you so much, uh, James. I'll begin by thanking the Oxford University Music Society for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, thank you, James, for organizing everything and inviting me to be here this very cold evening. And I have to say it's great to see a paperback of my book there. So that's the book that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, one particular chapter that James uh, suggested would be interesting for us to talk about is the chapter on uh, legacies of injustice and racial inequality. So that's, uh, that's the chapter that I'm going to be talking about. You'll be pleased to hear. I won't be going through the whole book. Uh, and in fact, I won't be going through the whole chapter. I'm just going to choose some themes uh, from the chapter that I think are interesting for us to think about. And uh, it's great uh, to see students interested in Austrian economics and also in some of the political and philosophical uh, debates surrounding. We were just talking about that uh, before the talk started, that it's not what people ordinarily associate with the Austrian school. They think it's about you know, money and finance. So it's really nice to, uh, to, for, to, to know that people are interested as well in some of the libertarian principles, principles of liberty. Uh, that underlie uh, Austrian economics, and that's what I want to talk about in particular this evening, and also just to think about how uh, Austrian scholars approach these debates, and why, and on what grounds, if they don't appear to be uh, immediately of interest. Uh, so I'll begin by uh, observing, I think we've all noticed this, that supporters of free market capitalism are often thought wrongly to be uninterested in justice. And they're thought to be unconcerned about human well-being and the plight of our fellow men and things like poverty and destitution. But on the contrary, as you will know, as Austrian scholars, it is precisely because we are concerned about human well-being that we promote free markets, productivity and peaceful interaction and exchange between all peoples and this is a point that's powerfully made by Mises in his book, Liberalism, the classical tradition where he says, and I quote, that there is want and misery in the world is not, as the average newspaper reader in his dullness is only too prone to believe, an argument against liberalism. It is precisely want and misery that liberalism seeks to abolish, and it considers the means that it proposes the only suitable ones for the achievement of this end. We support free markets because we think free markets are the only means suitable to achieve the end of eradicating want and deprivation. Uh, he's writing there about the classical conceptualization of liberalism. And I think that history has proved the truth of these words, proved the role of capitalism and free markets in raising living standards around the world. I think that the evidence on that is not contested. So I have three themes from the book that I would like to uh, focus on for my talk. First, I want to explain why you should be interested in the racial inequality debates. It seems like a topic that's not directly connected, perhaps, to some of the economic issues that Austrians are concerned about. And I want to link the, the significance of these debates to the defense and protection of property rights. So I'm just going to say a little bit about how I see that link. And then I'll discuss the importance of understanding the causes of inequality. I think a lot of the confusion that arises in these debates is because we have a lot of people who either don't know what causes economic inequality or they don't care. They don't think it's relevant. They have all these ideas about what they want to achieve and they don't think that it's important to pause and ask what are the actual causes of uh, economic inequality. And third, I will address the meaning of justice in the libertarian tradition. This is indeed the most important theme that I want to highlight this evening and is perhaps the most important theme in my uh, most recent book that James was showing and in previous work that I've written, like uh, my previous book on economic freedom and uh, inequality. It's just this idea of justice and how you respond to people who say that their claims are designed to promote justice. When people are proceeding under the banner of justice, it often appears as if there's no answer. After all, we all want to promote justice. I assume nobody says 
You know, I'm in favor of injustice and I want to promote injustice. So we all want to promote justice, but the issue is what do we mean by that? What does justice entail? And so that's what I want to talk about. And my argument, uh, it's a spoiler alert, my argument is that political demands couched in the language of justice, especially so-called racial justice that you often hear bandied about, often have nothing to do with justice. And uh, in most cases, the reference to justice is simply an attempt to avoid robust economic disputation. You meet an economist and you would have to debate the pros and cons of whatever you're proposing. But if you say, ah, we're doing this for justice, you almost end the debate before it's begun because nobody wants to oppose the idea of justice. So you then avoid having to show whether your schemes are beneficial you avoid having to show whether the cost of implementing them is worthwhile because you are uh, getting, in fact, what I might call a free pass in implementing justice. You don't have to substantiate or justify your claims. Professor Hayek wrote about this uh, in the Constitution of Liberty, uh, where he says, and I quote, the people who habitually employ the phrase social justice simply do not know themselves what they mean by it and they just use it as an assertion that a claim is justified without giving a reason for it. And if you ask them, I should know because I have often asked them, what do you mean by social justice? They, they find that uh, almost a, a shocking thing to ask because they think it's self-evident. You know, we all know what social justice is and all that remains is to promote it. And that's the point that Hayek is making there. And Professor Thomas Sowell makes a similar point in his book, Cosmic Justice, where he's saying that people have this cosmic idea of justice in the universe. And so they have this vague notion of promoting justice whenever they propose racial equalization schemes. And the same function I would like to suggest is served by other beguiling labels like kindness and compassion, inclusiveness, diversity, making people feel welcome. These are labels, I call them beguiling because everybody wants to support these things. Nobody says, oh no, no, I don't want to make people feel welcome. Th these are things that we are all going to support and so they are used to provide cover for many other schemes that actually we should be questioning and we often don't. So that's a, a, an important uh, point, I think, in understanding these debates. And as a preliminary point, I should also mention that in the book, uh, we distinguish between classical liberal and libertarian perspectives. But for purposes of this talk, I'm going to refer to both classical liberal and libertarian scholars. And if anybody has any questions about you know, who's classified under which school, we can talk about that later in the Q&A. Uh, so that's the structure of my talk. I want to explain why we should be concerned about this topic then discuss the causes of racial inequality, and then move on to discussing the meaning of justice. So first, why should we care about the racial inequality debates? And the answer to that is because of the implications for property rights. So we cannot be concerned to defend property rights and then just ignore the debates going on because they directly challenge uh, property rights in a number of different ways. So we have claims for wealth redistribution that require taking property from some and giving it to others by force. We have uh, racial preferences in allocation of tax spending. So you're raising taxes from everyone, you know, because paying taxes isn't voluntary. But then you're spending only on some groups. So some people are being taxed to fund schemes that they cannot benefit from because they're not, they, they're not members of the race that's supposed to benefit from those schemes. So I include that as well. Reparations, where people say, I'm entitled to reparations for historical injustice based on my race. A point that I've, of, I've often made about historical injustice is that there's no group of people on earth today that cannot find some injustice at some point in their history. So if we say some groups are entitled to reparations based on their race and other groups are not entitled to reparations based on their race, that is another uh, factor that I think has serious implications 
for how we think about property rights for the simple reason that the people paying to fund these schemes aren't being asked for their consent. I think that's an important point to make. If people are volunteering to pay reparations, there's no reason why they shouldn't be free to do so. That's a matter for them. It's a matter of choice. So I'm talking about situations where people are not given a choice in the matter. I am forced to pay reparations to somebody else based on so-called racial injustices. And I think that there are serious implications here for property rights. The most egregious example is perhaps the proposed legislation in South Africa, which is entitled expropriation without compensation. Expropriation without compensation, meaning they will seize your property and they say that this is to promote racial equity and you won't get compensated for it or rather to be, to be strictly accurate, you will get compensation in the amount of nil, okay? So they're allowed to assess your compensation at nil, meaning your property is uh, just seized without compensation. And it's not just land, although in the public debates, people are often debating land. The definition in the legislation just says property, any real or personal property. So it includes cash, it includes pensions and investments, stocks and shares, basically any property that's deemed to be necessary to redistribute in the public interest. That is a threat to private property. And I think we must be alert to the implications of these schemes for property rights and not just think, well, it's nothing, nothing to do with us. As Nozick observes in Anarchy, State and Utopia, and I quote, Returning stolen money or compensating for violation of rights are not redistributive, uh, end quote. So when I say we are concerned about these schemes, I'm not referring here to schemes that are designed to compensate people for a loss they've actually suffered, which in the ordinary case of legal disputes, if anybody steals your property, you can bring a claim for its return as long as the theft can be proved because quite clearly, if somebody steals your property, you're entitled to have it back. So that is not a challenge to property rights. In fact, that is a way to defend property rights if we're saying you should be able to vindicate the theft of your property. So what we're concerned here is with cases where wealth redistribution taking from one to give to another between racial groups, taking from members of one race to give to members of another race, or I should put it this way, taking from everybody to give to members of a specified race only, uh, is, is the kind of uh, claim that we are concerned about. So often people say, you know, your ancestors stole from my ancestors, but what they really mean there, they don't have evidence of a theft of property, they're just talking in general about a history of racial domination and subordination. So that's, that's the type of claim that I'm referring to here as being a threat to property rights. As Professor William Shaw has argued in the context of Africa, if you're making a historical claim to property based on legal evidence, so you're trying to trace your title historically, or based on archeological evidence, where you're saying the record here of the ownership of this property shows that it belonged to me as the descendant in title to the person who was dispossessed of the property. If you're making those types of claims, that's completely different from a claim based purely on membership of a racial group. So you're not pointing to any evidence of dispossession, but all you're saying is I belong to this race and on that basis, I have a claim to this property. That is the type of claim that I'm contesting. And Professor Shaw's point is that such amorphous pronouncements, so when people say, you stole my land, that's an amorphous pronouncement because it doesn't refer to anything specific. It's merely a claim of racial conflict that happened centuries ago. And he says those types of amorphous claims cannot be used to justify, for example, black people stealing farms from white farmers and saying that's to redress historical injustice. The notion of justice cannot be used to justify theft. I think that should be a 
plain and simple point. Property rights matter. Property rights matter still more in contexts where they're under threat. Property rights are not an impediment or obstacle to achieving justice. You may have seen these types of arguments in the newspapers, people saying, we need to amend the constitution, we need to allow, you know, working around property rights because property rights are preventing us, for example, from being able to redress homelessness. You know, why should somebody have two homes when other people have no homes at all? So they see property rights as an impediment to achieving justice. On the contrary, justice is predicated on property rights and on the right of a property owner to defend his life, his home and his property. In the terminology of human rights, classical liberals would say that property rights are human rights. And to that, the libertarian would add that there are no human rights that are not also property rights. Uh, Rothbard, uh, Murray Rothbard discusses this point in his book, The Ethics of Liberty. Uh, so if you haven't read that, that would be uh, something that would be helpful to read to explain why property rights are so fundamental to our concept of justice. So the case for reparations claims that any disparities between uh, the economic fortunes of different races or any economic gap between different groups, communities or nations is caused by past injustice. It is presumptive evidence of legacies of that injustice and that wealth transfers will close those economic gaps and therefore, that is the way to remedy past injustice and the resulting legacies. So that's the nature of the argument that we're dealing with. And as Professor Anthony Flew has observed, the underlying presumptions in those types of arguments are rooted in the idea that inequality in itself is unjust. So the moment you see a gap, an income gap or a wealth gap, that that presumptively tells you that there's an injustice there that needs to be corrected. And Professor Flew is saying that is uh, not correct. It is derived by egalitarians from Rawls's theory of distributive justice, where Rawls is saying justice, the demands of justice must be met by thinking about the distribution of, uh, distribution of whatever resource you're looking at between different members of society. So Rawls's approach may well be one way to think of justice, and Rawls's theory certainly commends itself to egalitarians, but it's not the only way to understand justice, and it is certainly not the libertarian way. And so having said that, let's uh, move on to the second point I want to make, which is about the causes of inequality. As I've said, it is often claimed that economic outcomes and wealth disparities between racial groups are caused by legacies of oppression. You hear people making this claim without even further substantiation. They think it's obvious. So they would say, you know, I come from a country that was colonized and that's why I'm poor. I come from a people that were enslaved and that's why I'm poor. They think it's self-evident that their economic condition today is explained by those historical injustices and is attributable to those historical events. So the people who are often referred to as social justice warriors who are campaigning for social justice would claim that the actions of people today and the life experiences of people today are constrained and determined by injustices suffered by their ancestors. And so they would take it as, as self-evident in the sense that if they can show you the suffering that happened in the past, that's all you need to know to understand why people are suffering from uh, economic underperformance today. And that's why I'm saying the causal explanation is missing because of that assumption that it's self-evident. Uh, so often these claims about causation are very loosely framed. We're told that a historical event occurred, you know, here are the pictures, you can see all the hor horrible things that happened, and now people are poor. And it's assumed that that follows from the historical injustice that's been shown. The argument that economic inequality is caused by so-called legacies of injustice is constructed upon a set of causal relations, the validity of which is taken by critical race theories to be self-evident. 
and thus not to require further exposition or substantiation. So the economist Walter Williams wrote about this, that when he talks about uh, whether economic outcomes are caused by discrimination, people get very confused and they say, are you denying that discrimination exists? Because they think it's self-evident that if the discrimination exists, that is what has caused the economic outcome. And uh, Professor Williams' point is, it doesn't follow that because discrimination exists, that's the explanation for economic outcomes. We still need to investigate and find out why people have the economic outcomes they have. In fact, he shows by a study of many different peoples that we have peoples in the world who've suffered horrific discrimination and they haven't suffered the same economic outcomes. So that tells us that there must be a missing causal connection between the discrimination and the poverty that we're seeing today, which is what uh, led him to conduct his study. Uh, Professor Thomas Sowell has done also many studies on this point, comparing different groups who've suffered uh, historic injustice and trying to see what their outcomes are today. And trying to say that this tells us that discrimination or historical injustice does not by itself explain the economic outcomes that we see. So critical race theories do not investigate causation. It's of no interest to them. Critical race theories presume the causal connection between historical injustice and contemporary discrimination. So if you ask them, why are you saying that you're discriminated against? They'll say, oh, look, because of colonialism because of slavery. So that's an, a presumption that because something happened in the past, therefore we are suffering discrimination today. And built on that, there's a second presumption, namely that because we're experiencing discrimination today, that is why we have weak economic outcomes. So they think that all these things are causally connected and they see unequal wealth, unequal income as a legacy of the exploitative relationship between historical oppressors and the historically oppressed. You may have seen this, they've basically divided all the races into the oppressor races and the oppressed races. I think the oppressor races are like people who are classified as white. And the oppressed races are people who are classified as not being white. And then it follows from that that they tell you uh, that's the reason why we have unequal wealth. And because that inequality has been caused by those historical uh, injustices, we need to correct those historical injustices and then the unequal outcomes will disappear. And the way we correct those historical injustices is by equalizing wealth. This is the way that critical race theory uh, reasons, if you can call it reasoning. There's a set of presumptions there that they presume to be self-evident. Moreover, critical race theories assert that contemporary discrimination is systemic in nature. Now, what does that mean? It means that racism is manifested not in specified individual conduct or particular individual life experiences, but in the very system on which society in general is constructed. So they'll say the legal system is systemically racist. The criminal justice system is systemically racist. The police are systemically racist. So you, you can't show a particular policeman who's done something racist, but what you're saying is that the system itself uh, uh, is systemically racist. And if you look back at the reports, you know, we've had many official reports saying, oh, yes, 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 there's systemic racism. But if you look at those official reports, you will find adjudicators and judges are very fair to the actual people who are involved in those investigations. They're fair to them. And they say, we're not accusing this person of being a racist. We're not. And we're not saying that this person should have done something different in the circumstances in which he acted. But they're saying the system, without pinning it on any particular individual, is racist. Why? Because of the outcomes that we are seeing, which were bad outcomes. And that's the nature of systemic racism. Society as a whole is said to be systemically racist. For example, it's supposed that merely by being present in society, black people are experiencing racial injustice you can't really ask them why, what's happened to you? What's, you know, who did something wrong to you? Because nothing happened. They're saying the society, it's, it's almost like it's in the air that we breathe. 
And so it's really difficult to counter uh, those kinds of um, claims because of their amorphous nature. So by presuming these types of causal connections between first, historical injustice, second, uh, systemic racial discrimination, and third, economic outcomes, where you're saying because of the systemic racism, I am poorer than other people, critical race theorists construct their solution to economic inequality. They say that paying, and this is where reparations comes in, they say paying for historical crimes would resolve the historical injustice. Resolving the historical injustice would end discrimination, which is systemic, and ending systemic discrimination would result in equal outcomes. Fantastic. Everyone's going to have equal amounts of wealth. Everyone's going to have equal uh, income. You know, everyone's going to get paid equal wages and it's going to be, you know, some kind of socialist paradise. What happens when we see that wealth and um, income are not equal? They take that as evidence that more redistribution needs to be done. So you'll hear them saying, oh, well, look, we're still not equal. We're still, there's still a pay gap. You know, they're always measuring pay gaps. There's still a pay gap. We're still unequal. That's the evidence that more redistribution needs to be done. Or as they say, we need to equity harder. You know, they call this equity and you just keep on doing it until you see equality at the end. Well, I disagree with that. In the book, I explain why we must take causation seriously. We must ask what causes inequality. Professor Elaine Sternberg in her paper, Defining Capitalism, identifies the causes of things in the economic sense as causes on which we can base decisions. That's what we're looking for when we ask what has caused inequality. We want a cause that we can fix if we're trying to reduce inequality. As she expresses it, and I quote, all effects require the coming together of a jointly sufficient set of antecedent conditions. What counts as the cause of an effect is usually a function of the relative distinctiveness and manageability of the various elements of the causal set. So you're looking at the elements of a causal set that together have caused the outcome that you are concerned about. And when people declare that the reason for their economic failure lies in events that transpired in the 18th century or the 19th century and sometimes even earlier, they're not referring to the cause of their failure in the sense that uh, Professor Sternberg describes. They have simply failed to take seriously the need to establish the causal links between historical events and the life they now live. Without correctly identifying the causes of a phenomenon, it's impossible to understand it or to evaluate it. And no social problem can be resolved when the causes are not correctly identified. So this is the task to which libertarian economists and classical liberal economists have devoted much of their work. So economists like Peter Bauer, the development economist, who's asking why, do under, why are underdeveloped nations underdeveloped? We want to know the causes, right? We can't just say, oh, you know, it's because of colonialism. Because if we say that, we'll never fix anything. We don't know what has caused it. We need to know so we can fix it. Uh, Robert Higgs, who studied uh, the uh, economic fortunes of black people in the United States uh, during slavery and just after emancipation. Walter Williams and Thomas Sowell, who've also done a lot of comparative work, as I was saying earlier. They're trying to investigate and explain the causes of economic underperformance by black people. And I think that their findings are well known because they're discussed a lot uh, in the public debates. They look at things like family, stable families. They look at things like education, health, uh, even things like uh, the, the environment in which people live, the geography. They're looking at many different causal factors that may be causing economic uh, underperformance. And that's the point that I think that people need to take seriously, which they don't when they say, oh, no, it's discrimination, it's historical injustice. They're ignoring all the causal factors. So an, an example I like to give is rates of illiteracy. So some black communities run rates of illiteracy as high as 80%. In some cities, 90% of children are unable to read and write. 
are unable to do basic maths. So if 90% of your children cannot read or do basic maths, you don't need to go looking for what the causes are of your, eco your poor economic outcomes because you won't make progress if you cannot read and you cannot do basic maths. So this is why uh, it's to help people that we say we need to know the causes of inequality. And in the book, uh, we also ask the question, and this is perhaps a more philosophical question, is inequality unjust? Is inequality unjust? The claim is made in contemporary, de contemporary debates that inequalities of fortune are presumptively unjust. That is to say, the minute you spot a, a gap, an economic gap, that you say, well, that's an injustice and we need to fix that. I disagree. From a classical liberal perspective, justice means to give each man his own. Justice does not require that everyone must have equal amounts of stuff, equal amounts of money, equal life experiences, if such a thing could even be measured. On this point, libertarians in the anarcho-capitalist tradition decisively part company with classical liberals. Libertarians in the uh, Rothbardian tradition, for example, do not regard inequality as a presumptive injustice that needs some form of state intervention to eradicate it. Pointing to a gap does not mean, oh, we need to do something to fix that gap. We need to ask why does this gap exist? We don't just say it's an evidence of an injustice. Professor Anthony Flew explains that justice in the classical sense is not synonymous with equality of condition, equality of outcome. So it follows that the absence of equal conditions is not in itself unjust, but rather account must be taken of how the inequality is manifested and what has caused that inequality. So Professor Flew is critical of arguments that presume justice and equality to be synonymous. You don't say uh, there is an inequality, therefore there is an injustice. It does not follow. Justice properly understood neither promises nor requires equal distribution of wealth or fortune. I therefore disagree with the concept often referred to as equal opportunities by people who never pause to consider what is meant by opportunity, how they propose to equalize everybody's opportunities, and by what test or measure they would be able to ascertain that everybody's opportunities are equal. Are your opportunities equal to my opportunities? Well, two people's opportunities are never going to be equal. One could say, for example, every child should have the opportunity to have a good start in life. I think we would all agree with that. A good education, good health, the opportunity to live a happy life, to realize his or her full potential. We would all agree with that. We want to do the best for our children. We want no child to be left behind. Those are excellent and worthy goals. But that is not the same thing as saying that the opportunities of all children must be equal. The opportunities of children in different families are not equal because families are not equal. I'm not even talking about wealth at this point, even if you take families with equal amounts of wealth, their family situation is not equal. Does somebody from a stable, happy home have the, an equal opportunity to do well with a test as somebody from a dysfunctional and chaotic home? This is why people are now abolishing tests, because they're saying, well, it's unfair. Some people come from good homes. They were studying, they were revising for their test, and other people come from dysfunctional homes. They had no chance to revise, so the test is unfair, it's not giving people equal opportunities. They want to eradicate the whole concept of merit because they say people don't have an equal chance to show that merit. They would even say uh, egalitarians who are known as luck egalitarians, they would actually say, if you get lucky, well, that's unfair, I didn't get lucky. So we don't have equal opportunities because you got lucky and I didn't. So they think everything should be equalized. Uh, what is meant by saying opportunities to pass a test are equal? Are they equal if one person is prepared and another is not? We actually have case law on this point uh, in the UK and the US where the courts are saying this is what is known as disparate impact or indirect discrimination where the courts are saying, look, the outcomes of that test are unequal between races 
white people performed better on the test than black people. We don't know why. We don't need to know why. The point is that there's a discrepancy, there's a disparity. That proof of discrimination in the absence of an explanation to the contrary, meaning the employer, in most of these cases, it's an employer who's giving tests for promotions, let's say, for example, and the white people are overperforming compared to the black people. And the court is saying, well, can you explain why there's that difference in performance? And if you can't explain, that is presumptive evidence of discrimination. That's where we've arrived at because we're trying to ensure everybody's uh, opportunities are exactly equal. But opportunities can never be equal between different families, different groups of people. Indeed, the opportunities of children in the same family are not equal because their talents, their personalities, their interests differ and will influence their life opportunities. For example, the opportunity to be a professional footballer, the opportunity to be a concert pianist, Indeed, as Professor Sowell puts it, nobody is equal to anybody else. Even the same man, he says, is not equal to himself on different days. So we are in search of this elusive equalization of everybody's opportunities, which has taken a very sinister turn. And the people behind these equalization schemes find themselves destroying and dismantling social institutions, including the family which they see as a hotbed of unequal opportunities. You see some of these, uh, I don't know, socialists saying, it's not fair that some people come from loving families and some people don't, their families are broken down. We have to equalize that by ensuring that people who come from stable families are not enjoying what they see as an unfair advantage of the people who come from dysfunctional families for no fault of their own. They want to equalize that by giving the state an increasing role in things that the family would normally be doing because they say the state will at least be equal. So people from the good families and people from the poor families, you know, they'll all be equal because the state will be looking after them and the state will be everybody's mother and father. This is very, very sinister. They inevitably find themselves unable to equalize everyone's opportunities. They are driven in frustration and desperation to begin equalizing outcomes, as you see going on at present, with things like racial quotas, affirmative action, equalization of pay, equalization of promotions. And that is where it inevitably ends up. And so when I highlight the importance of causation and I say that we must identify the causes of inequality, my aim is simply to show that the claims made by critical race theories are wrong. But I do not regard inequality as a self-evident problem because I distinguish between equality or inequality on the one hand and poverty or deprivation or human suffering on the other hand. I am concerned about alleviating poverty, deprivation and human suffering. As I quoted earlier from Mises, free markets are the only way to accomplish that goal. We try to increase prosperity and to help the poor it does not mean that we're trying to equalize and to close gaps. As such, I do not regard human inequalities as unjust. Inequality of wealth, fortune, talent, opportunity is inherent in the human condition. I do not agree with those who wish to rail against nature. Here I draw upon Murray Rothbard's egalitarianism as a revolt against nature. I think some of you are familiar with that essay. If you're not, you should definitely read it. It explains all this. In, uh, in detail. Uh, we uh, talk about that in the book and we link this to the idea of natural right. And I just think I need to uh, comment on that and to just clarify that not all Austrian economists uh, would adopt the natural right approach to thinking about this. For example, uh, Mises uh, does not believe in natural rights, in human action. He says that utilitarian philosophy and classical economics, here I'm quoting from human action, have nothing at all to do with the doctrine of natural right. With them, the only point that matters is social utility. They recommend popular government, private property, tolerance and freedom, not because they are natural and just, but because they are beneficial. So not all uh, economists would agree with natural right, 
if they're utilitarians, they clearly won't. But my reason for drawing upon the natural law tradition is in order to engage with these uh, contemporary de debates about justice and to be able to answer them on their own terms. I take demands couched in the language of justice seriously by asking what is meant by justice and how can we answer that by reference to the meaning of justice. And this brings me to my final point, which is what do we mean by justice? What does justice mean? The idea that we can reverse historical injustice by reallocating wealth between different racial groups is rooted in what Professor Sowell calls an intertemporal view of justice. The idea that past injustice can be retrospectively corrected by action taken in the present. This is wrong. We don't have a TARDIS. We can't go back in time, like Doctor Who, fix everything, do history properly. Here we are with what we have today. How then should we think about justice today, here and now, in the place that we all find ourselves? The classical ideal of justice is reflected in the principle of formal equality. Formal equality means everyone has equal rights in the eyes of the law. It's not about saying, did you have an equal opportunity to perform well in the test? It's not about saying, did you have an equal family experience? It's saying that you are equal, everyone's an equal human being in the eyes of the law. Nobody has special rights based on their race. I can't say I have rights as a black person that do not vest in you as a white person because our rights vest in human beings and we are all equal as human beings. Nobody, no matter their race, is justified in infringing on the rights of others, nor is anyone entitled to preferential treatment at the expense of others based on their race. Further, justice in the classical liberal tradition is based on individual responsibility. So any attempt to enforce notions of collective guilt is unjust. As H.D. Lewis argues in his 1948 article, Collective Responsibility. Individual responsibility is a basic ethical principle. Lewis says, and I quote, no one can be responsible in the properly ethical sense for the conduct of another. Responsibility belongs essentially to the individual. This principle lies at the heart of the presumption of innocence and the associated principle that anyone who accuses another of wrongdoing bears the burden of proof. If you stole something, I cannot be asked to pay for it. Nor can I just say, you stole my stuff on the basis that you know your ancestors stole my ancestors' things. You have to prove the claim against the person that you are accusing. Further, as H.D. Lewis adds, and I quote, a structure cannot be the bearer of moral responsibility. Neither can society in general, for these are both abstractions which we must be careful not to hypostatize. hypostatize. It follows that we cannot accept the concept of systemic racism. The system is racist. It also means we cannot make any person liable to pay reparations for what his community or his tribe or his race or even his own forebears who bear his own name are said to have done in the past. The collectivist preoccupation with group disparities is obsessed with measuring and comparing gaps between groups. What are the earnings of white people compared to the earnings of black people? That's what they do. Individuals are completely irrelevant when they're measuring gaps. Black millionaires are irrelevant when they classify black people as oppressed. White philanthropists are irrelevant when they describe white people as oppressors. Poor white people are simply overlooked in constructing notions of so-called white privilege. Comparing groups of people in this way, classifying them as oppressed and oppressor is what I'm calling this collectivism that completely erodes notions of individual rights, free will and choice that are associated with individual liberty. So what can we conclude uh, from everything that I've said this evening? First, that racial preferences designed to redress historical injustice are themselves unjust. We cannot redress historical injustice by implementing new injustices against innocent people today or in the future. 
That's the first point. Second, any measures designed to implement such schemes under the banner of equity, as they are often called, are wrong and should be opposed as such. And third, justice does not require equal outcomes, nor does justice require the equalization of everyone's opportunities, a goal which is humanly impossible and amounts, as Rothbard said, to a revolt against nature. Rather, justice requires formal equality, meaning equal rights and equal status in the eyes of the law, regardless of race, sex, or any other aspect of our personal identity or our group identity. Thank you for listening, and I think James said we would have time for questions.